Well, uh, we didn't turn anything on. The well, we've done a lot of tying, and I know that uh, you've been only tying one of each pattern. You don't want to do that when you tie, do you? No, typically it's at least half a dozen. Yes, because you want to go out fishing, and you never want to have one in your box. That's surely the, the one you're going to break off after you catch a few fish. That guarantees the fly's success. Lights. There's one fly that's the king of all the flies. When you're on a river, it's the stone flies. But when you're on a lake, what is it? It's probably these big dragons. These are a fearsome predator. I've studied them in aquariums. I, I recall having one in there in a 30-gallon aquarium once. Put him in in July. He was an inch long. By the end of the season, October, he was two and a half inches long, and he'd eaten everything else in the tank except two leeches, and he had to go at them, too. Very aggressive predator. Long life cycle as a nymph in still waters. Big ticket item. Something you can fish all season long. It's, like you said, it's that big Terranarsis nymph. It's just lots to imitate, fun for the fly tire, and obviously the fish like them, too. You know, there's so much to lakes more than just woolly buggers. If you ask most people, what do you fish on a lake? They'd give you three flies in America. And we've covered a whole bunch of flies. And there's a lot more. There's a lot more variations, isn't there? There's tons. These are just a dozen of, of uh, you'll say, my current favorites. The list is always evolving. We talked about that. You've seen my fly boxes are just chocker block full of of uh, all kinds of different food items and I've been woken my wife thinks I'm crazy but I've woken up upright in the middle of the night had a concept in my head and just couldn't put it to bed so to speak and down at the vice and sort of created it and evolved flies from there so it's never changing well I know I was at the start of rubber legs on flies and got severely criticized with putting legs on things that shouldn't have legs on it. And I am so delighted to see some rubber legs on a dragonfly. And I want to see how this fly is tied. And what a fly to end our tape with. Because I that is an innovative looking uh, dragonfly. So let's go to the vice. OK, Jack. All right, I'm now going to tie you some meat and potatoes, a big, nasty dragonfly nymph. Um, this dragonfly imitates the um, crawling nymphs of the Aeacinidae family, and uh, these are a big, voracious predator capable of growing in excess of two inches long uh, with long, multi-year life cycles as a nymph. They can spend up to uh, four years, or in some cases slightly longer, depending on their emergence cycle. So these are a prey item that trout see an awful lot of, and they're a big ticket item, and it's a food source, a big rainbow or a big brown or a big brook trout seldom passes up when one creeps by its nose. The problem with dragonfly nymphs is you have to fish them to be successful in or near weed beds, and that's an inherently a uh, risky proposition because you always end up fouling them up. So my dragonfly nymphs always feature a buoyant uh, focus to them to keep them up and out of trouble. Um, it's either in the past been through spun um, deer hair that I've clipped to shape, or now with the advent and explosion and popularity of foam, that's what we're going to utilize here in the grizzly dragon. So into the jaws of the vise, I placed a size six, four extra long um, streamer hook, and I'm just going to use some six aught. Um, tying thread, olive in this case, to complement the color of the fly we're going for here. We're using a two-tone um, um, olive uh, grizzly marabou as the overbody. And we're just going to cover the uh, hook shank with, uh, with tying thread. For the underbody on this fly, I'm going to use some black booby eye foam medium. And this fly can actually trace its roots back to the booby, which is an English design pattern, essentially a leech with a long marabou tail, a dubbed or a crystal chenille body or a marabou body, and big foam eyeballs tied on the fly like this. And the whole concept of this fly is you fish it on a fast sinking line, on a short leader, the fast sinking line drags that buoyant fly down along the bottom, the line actually lays in the bottom, and the buoyant nature of this fly, it bobs and skips along right above the weed tops. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So we're basically taking that concept of a booby and incorporating those uh, ideas into a more realistic uh, and suggestive approach to the problem. So, on with the body. So with the medium foam here, I'm just going to take, I'm going to trim it, I'm going to trim this on a slight angle, okay? And we're going to move that tying thread just up 
I'm going to lay that so that angle is flat onto the hook shank and then using open wraps bind that in place and then carry that tying thread forward to about the three quarters mark on the shank and I'm just going to, if I've done this right looks like I have on the size 6 hook which is probably a good standard dragonfly nymph hook um, early in the season you can tie them on large hooks like this when the nymphs the most mature nymphs are going to emerge that uh, early to mid summer uh, are going to be ready to go they're going to be this bigger size and in the late fall you may want to tie this in eights or even tens to suggest the less mature nymphs that still have a year or two left in their nymphal cycle so we've got that looks like a big long beetle right now and now we're just going to take our tying thread and it open spirals, secure it down, but I don't want to compress this too tightly or I kill all the flotation that I'm trying to, to put in. But I've got that in place and when the body is nice and firm, it's not going to spin and twist around. Now, what we're going to do is form a dubbing loop and then in, using a magic tool, fold some grizzly marabou into the jaws of the magic tool and use the clear clip to insert those into the dubbing loop and wind that forward. So the first step here is I'm going to form the dubbing loop. So I'm just going to pull down on the tying thread and I'm going to form about a three, maximum four inch dubbing loop. The uh, smaller the fly, the smaller the loop. And I'm going to carry that tying thread forward again and open spirals up to the front of that foam underbody. And I'm going to insert spring-loaded dubbing twister and let it hang. Now it's time for the magic tool. So here we have the magic tool, and again when we purchase it, it comes with a, a second smaller clip and some smaller sized benches. For this grizzly dragon, we're going to use this medium, uh, sorry, the larger sized bench uh, because we, we're going to use it to fold the grizzly marabou plume. So we'll just get these clips out of the way so they don't clutter up what we're doing. And what we're going to do is I'm taking a light olive grizzly marabou plume here grasping it by the tip, stroking the fibers down so they stand and radiate out away from the stem. And I'm going to do the same for a olive grizzly marabou plume. And I'm going to lay them butt to tip. So again, we take that fiber, stroke them along, lay them on top. Once the, marabou's, the grizzly marabou is in place, I simply grasp both ends pull on them and fold them into the jaws of the magic tool like so. Once folded, I pick them up and I hold it up near the top of the tool because if I grasp it down by the bottom, I run the risk of accidentally opening the jaws and dumping everything out before I want to. And I'm just going to trim away the tip areas. And now we're going to turn the magic tool onto its side. And we're going to take our clip, in this case the larger of the clips, and I'm going to open the jaws, sliding the grizzly marabou between the jaws of the magic tool clip, and then grasp the tip area um, of the grizzly marabou. And this clear clip is really great because you can size, if I want to make a smaller gra uh, uh, length material, I can grab it here. But I need the full length here, so we're just going to grab it, remove it from the tool, and slide it away. And if we're not sure again, we can still move it around a bit. Once you get comfortable with the tool, you can manipulate it however you'd like. So I'm just going to rotate this around with my left hand. And I'm going to take my scissors and trim out the stems. Because I only want the tip, the soft tip fibers um, for the body on this fly. Now it's time to insert the prepared grizzly marabou into the dubbing loop. I'm just going to push forward slightly on the dubbing tool to open up the loop. Take advantage of the wedge-like profile of the magic tool clip and slide the, the material in between the thread strands. Pull down to pinch the uh, grizzly marabou between the thread strands and then release my grip. With the first clump placed into the dubbing loop, I've prepared a second application in the same manner as the first, folding them within the benches of the magic tool and then using the magic tool clip to remove them from the bench and then trimmed away the unwanted stems. And this way I'm just going to simply push on this dubbing loop again to open it up, 
you take advantage of the wedge-like profile of the magic tool clip and pinch it into the jaws of the dubbing loop. Kind of looks like it's uh, all out of control here. We're just going to spin that loop very, very slowly so we don't accidentally throw anything out of the dubbing loop. And then as the materials are firmly trapped within the, the uh, thread strands, we can spin it up nice and tight. And on this six, size 6 fly experience has taught me that about two applications using the large tying bench uh, are sufficient to form the body here. So now with the stubbing loop uh, completely twisted, it's all we have to do is simply wind it forward to complete the body. I'm now going to wind the Grizzly Marabou dubbing noodle forward over the foam underbody to form the body of this fly. We'll get that wrapped around, keep our thread out of harm's way. And I'm supporting the fly at the back, make sure it's positioned properly. And then we're just going to wind this forward. And you can use your left thumb and forefinger for your right-handed tires. It's the opposite for the lefties out there, which believe it or not, I, I am a left-handed person, but I actually tie right-handed. And we're just going to carry this forward and completely cover that foam underbody there. And it looks a little scruffy and unkempt, but we can fix that because now we're going to treat this fly as though it was a muddler. We're going to actually trim this uh, flush along the bottom and along the top to a dragon nymph shape. But keep in mind that this grizzly marabou material Uh, like all marabous, slims considerably when wet, so we don't want to trim this too flush. We want to actually trim it oversized and keep the hourglass shape of the crawling, sorry, the sprawling, rather the crawling nymphs, the sprawling nymphs that are ambush feeders, that are more spider-like in appearance. This fly is aimed at imitating the crawling nymphs that walk around the bottom debris and weed beds in search of their prey. So we want to keep that profile in mind. Again, you can stroke the, the hair and like other deer hair applications, you can cut and preen and fuss with these flies for really far longer than is actually necessary. In fact, scruffy and dirty looks good for this fly because again, once these materials get wet, they um, sweep into shape and the legs also help sweep this into shape as well, which we'll be tying in a little bit. And there you have um, the completed body. And you can see it doesn't look like much of anything right now, but it's good and scruffy, and that's what we want. We use pretty flies to catch fly fishermen and ugly flies to catch fish. For the wing case, I'm using a prepared slip of Stillwater Solutions uh, model turkey quill. I've coated this with a flexible cement so it remains durable and we're just going to tie this in place by laying it flat across the back of the fly and using one wrap, two wraps and then I apply tension and then we're going to double back style this by taking this part of the wing case that's protruding forward and folding it back over the top of the fly and now we secure that in place with tying thread as well. And now we just need to come in and do this after the fly, but it's usually easy to do it now. Let's just come in on about a 30 degree angle and make one sharp trim. And we've got a two, two layered wing case, much like the natural nymphs. I'm going to carry the tying thread forward. And now we're going to tie in our legs. And for our leg material, going to use some of the Stillwater Solutions Midge Stretch Floss. This is the light olive, or you can use the Chaoberus Green. Um, and we're going to model these up with a permanent marker. So how we're going to do these is I'm just going to tie them in place. Dragonfly has six stout legs that it uses to crawl amongst the bottom weeds and debris, and these flex and breathe and move in the water just like the nymph's natural legs. But when the nymph um, 
bolts for cover or flees or wants to pounce on a prey. It has the ability to uh, take in water through its abdomen and eject it out its back door, a little afterburner system, if you will, and allows the nymph to dart through the water in three to four inch bursts. And what happens then is these legs tuck along the sides and and uh, so you've got the great benefit here of legs that while the fly is being slowly retrieved will wiggle and move like a crawling nymph and when you strip the fly um, which I often do through the retrieve a couple of short strips to maybe draw attention to imitate a fleeing nymph they'll tuck nicely along the side so we've got these legs figurated in place now it's time to tie them into position I'm going to take the near side sorry the far side set of legs first simply hold them along the sides of the fly and bind them in place so that they flow along. This is a great way to position the legs properly rather than trying to get them tied in exactly on target with the first wraps. It makes it very difficult. I'm going to carry that thread forward once again and do the same technique for the near side legs. I'm going to gather them, hold them in place, and secure them along the sides of the fly. You see how those legs trail along. And you can manipulate and play with them a little bit, twist them around, and then once you're really happy, you can really pound in some extra thread wraps to make sure that they're well and truly in place. Now, this is a great time to mark the legs up. I'm going to use a uh, contrasting color. I've got a brown permanent marker here. And all I'm going to do is gather the legs on the far side while they're still long, so I can hold the legs, and I'm just going to draw the tip of the marker across and mark them up and do the same on the near side. Gather them and draw them just to give them that model look of the naturals. I do it when it's long because I don't run the risk of marking my fingers up as badly. So once these legs are together we gather them all, trim them all at the same time so that they all become the same length and I'm just going to hold them. I don't want to pull tightly on my legs because when I trim them, they're going to come out too short. So I just gather and support them. And it's okay to exaggerate the length a little bit to get a little more motion out of them and just slightly past the bend of the hook. And there's our legs ready to go. And it's okay if they're springing out in all different directions because they look like independent legs and will move and creep through the water just like the natural nymphs. So now it's time to tie on the eyes. And for the eyes, we're going to use the same um, booby eye foam, but we're going to use the small, okay? And these are approximately a quarter inch in diameter and about halfway between the hook eye and the wing case is where these eyes are going to go in place. Again, this is a buoyant feature that also uh, serves a double duty as an imitative feature as well because it will represent the, represent the large uh, eyes that are uh, common to the the crawling nymphs. So we get those in place. Again, this is a feature directly borrowed, stolen, uh, rented, if you will, from the English booby. So to finish off the head area, I'm going to use some of the dark olive green um, Stillwater Solutions soft blend dubbing material. Moisten my fingers and spin it up onto the tying thread. You want to keep this slender if you can. It's easier to add more dubbing and it's easier to work with a, a slender dubbing noodle than a big fat one. So we're just going to start by winding the dubbing directly behind the eyes. And if there's some legs that you want to position a little better, like this near side set seems to be springing up on me a bit, so I can hold them in place and use this dubbing process to further uh, position them. And then I weave the balance of the dubbing in and around the eyes. So we'll take a little bit more. And again, we'll moisten our fingers. Spun up another dubbing loop that probably no more than an inch long here. And we'll weak, weave that in and around our eyes. And right in front. And we'll take our whip finisher. Pull down. And whip finish that fly directly in front. and trim away the tying thread. I suppose you could leave those eyes big like that, but what we're going to do is come in with our scissors 
and trim them, oh, about half their distance. So they're just about as wide, slightly um, slender, more slender than the width of the body. So just trim them like that. And again, you can see, and that's the completed grizzly dragon. Again, we're going to fish this on fast sinking lines, type three, four, five, even six densities, and let that short leader anywhere from three to six feet, depending on the weed growth and the bottom structure. And that fast sinking line drags this fly down into the depths, and the buoyant nature of this fly will suspend this above the bottom and keep it virtually weedless. Just trim the bottom here. Again, what you're looking for here is a nice, scruffy, big stake for a foraging rainbow or brown or brook trout to come up behind and inhale. Be careful, strikes to this fly tend to be kind of severe. Well, you know, it's uh, starting to get into the mid-afternoon, warming up. Uh, it's dragonfly time. If this was uh, probably a hot August day, we'd be definitely looking at the dragonflies. But you know, the, dragon, the, the dragonfly nymphs are always in the water. Yes, they are, Jack. And you, you told me that, by God, this fly could work right now. Mm -hmm. But tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, fishing these, these dragonflies and a little bit of why you tie it the way you do. Well, I pretty well tie all of my dragonfly patterns the same basic philosophy, and that's one focused around buoyancy. And what we've got here is a uh, grizzly dragon uh, it's had a dunking already, and you can see um, before, when the fly is dry, it looks like a bit like a feather duster. But once it gets wet, all the uh, marabou lies down, and this fly has a buoyant core with a foam underbody and foam eyes, uh, borrowed from an, an English pattern called the booby. And the idea of this, I'm fishing this fly on a fast sinking type 6 fly line with a very short leader. I've probably got four or five feet of leader. That's it. And the concept being that the fly line pulls this fly, literally drags it under the surface, and the fly line is actually lying along the bottom, and I'm just creepy crawling and inching this fly along, and because it's buoyant in nature, it's going to resist hanging up on the bottom, and fish can come up behind it and, and take it in. And takes to this are usually pretty solid. So what we're doing here is I've cast the fly line out, and I'm just right now, I'm using a variety of retrieves, a steady hand twist to imitate a nymph that's just out and about looking for food. They're very predatory in nature, so I'm just imitating the flies that's crawling over the bottom. I can add a few quick strips to draw attention to the fly and then let it sit. And dragonflies have the ability to shoot water um, out of their, their uh, abdomens, out the backside, and they can jet along in four to six inch bursts. And they use this to escape uh, potential predators such as trout or other larger dragonfly nymphs, and also as a last sort of bull rush when they uh, attack whatever prey they've got in mind. And they can eat and tackle. They'll eat small minnows, uh, each other, damselflies, mayflies, coronamid larvae, pupa if there's one hanging near the bottom. They're just voracious prey. In other words, they're very crude insects. Yeah. As the sun sets on our Alberta fly tying adventure, I want to invite you to come down to the States and talk to my friends about fishing lakes and experience some of our great lakes. We got a lake in Wyoming called Monster Lake. I've heard of that one. You've that, heard of that one? That has a name that interests me. <laughs> we got another one just a little ways away that has a very English name, but we won't tell you about that. Oh, You're just going to have to come down. It. But I want to thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me along, Jack. And oh, right there. We're being paged. We're being paged. And so I'll let you get a little solitude. I'm going to go right over there and cast that fish. And I know that our fly lines are going to meet again. Yeah, thanks very much, Thank Jack. You. It's been a pleasure.